Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to tonight's living room lecture, Iron Working in Togo, Archaeological Research in the Basar Region from 2013 to 2020 with Dr. Philip DeBarros. My name is Stephanie Sandoval, and I'm the Public Archaeology Director at the San Diego Archaeological Center. The center is a nonprofit dedicated to the preservation of local archaeological collections. While our center remains closed to the public, please connect with us on our website and social media. Our next living room lecture is on Thursday, February 18th, Communing with Earth and Ancestors, Ancient Maya Cave Rituals by Dr. John Spinard. Info and registration can be found on our website at sandiegoarchaeology.org. Tonight, we will be using the Q&A feature. You can find it on your control panel. Feel free to submit questions at any time to the speaker or staff, and we will answer those at the end. I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Philip DeBarros this evening. Dr. DeBarros is, a, is Professor Emeritus of Anthropology and former coordinator of the archeology span program at Palomar College. He has been conducting archeological research about the Basar iron industry for the last 40 years. He began his voyage of discovery in Africa as a Peace Corps volunteer and administrator in Togo from 1966 to 1974. After his time at UCLA, he served as Director of Cultural Resources at Chambers Group Incorporated in Orange County for nine years before starting his teaching career at Palomar College in 1994. He has published numerous peer review articles and book chapters and is currently working on a two volume set in French on the Bassar Ironworking and the first volume will be published soon. Without further ado, I'm happy to turn it over to Dr. Philip DeBarros. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, good evening. I'm very glad that you are here to listen to the talk. Um, I tested it just before we began and uh, it'll probably last about an hour and then there'll be time for questions. And I encourage you to do write questions down as they come up, because you're likely to forget them if, by the end of the talk. That tends to be my experience. So I've been working on the Basar iron industry for 40 years, although for a 10 year period, I, I was not doing that from um, 89 to 99, because I was raising my kids, my wife. Um, but I'm gonna emphasize the latter part, the last 10 years or so, uh, but I will do a, a review of some of the things that took place in the earlier time because I did give a talk on the earlier period in 2013, but there may not be very many people who attended uh, both lectures. So I'll get going here. Um, here's West Africa, good part of it. And you can see Togo with the little colored dots there. And that's where the Basar region is. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Lome down in the south on the coast. And here it is focused in on Ghana, Benin, and Burkina Faso with Togo in the center. And then this highlights where the Basar region is in northern Togo. The Togo hills run diagonally through the country. It's only about 400 miles from north to south and 50 miles east to west, about the size of West Virginia, the country itself. And here's the heart of the Basar region. And I'll be talking about Banjali, the major ironworking center, and Bichabe, the main smithing center in this area. Dimori was for charcoal making. And then Kabu and Basar were chiefdoms in the 18th and 19th centuries up to when the German colonialists arrived. And um, here are two major early Iron Age sites that I'll be talking about. The rest of the discussion will be about later Iron Age sites. Um, so this. Uh, this map uh, is important to take a quick look at, and I will try to come back to it. This is the almost pure emetite mountain, or at least half of it, uh, near Banjali, and with very few impurities. So it was one of the best iron ores in Africa. This shows the result of my PhD research, and you can see these squares that represent nine square kilometers of survey where I recorded about 300 sites beginning my research and trying to look at patterns of uh, where people smelted and lived and so on. And you can see Dek Basanwar is showing, it shows up here as well. Uh, the black areas are volumes of slag. And at Chogma, which we'll be talking about later, you had about 15 to 18,000 cubic meters of slag, 180 mounds, some of them four to five meters high and 20 to 30 meters long. But you had other areas north of Kabu 
in the Tipabu, pardon me, Nababun area blown up and north of Basar. Bichabe uh, had some smelting in the 14th century, but then became a smithing center for the next, uh, after that. Here are the sites that I recorded at the time of my dissertation. Um, and we'll be looking at uh, the furnace site we'll be talking about dating to two to 400 BC is in this cluster of sites there, but I didn't discover it till 2013. Now there's too much data on this slide. I'm just gonna emphasize a couple of points. There's a terminal late stone age deposit at the bottom of a very large site called Dek Pasanwar that's during the early iron age. And uh, that, we do have a couple of radiocarbon dates from the Iron Age from 1371 to 514 uh, AD, pardon me, BC. Uh, somehow I left the BC off of there, sorry. Um, and there are some other radiocarbon dates though that, oh, pardon me, the iron working got full bloom by 400 BC to about 130 AD. We've got multiple radiocarbon dates, 13 of the, uh, 17 of them actually, uh, for the site as a whole. But there may have been a transitional period where some iron working was taking place as early as the 6th century BC, as shown by these dates here. And I'll leave it at that at this point. We'll come back to these sites in some detail. And these are the later Iron Age sites. The later Iron Age goes from about 1220 BC to the uh, mid 1950s AD when it, it was outlawed by the French. And the difference between the early Iron Age and the later Iron Age is they used forced draft furnaces with bellows to force the air in to make it smelt correctly. Uh, and the later Iron Age is dominated by natural draft furnaces, which are taller, where the hot air coming out the top of the furnace sucks in air at the bottom and itself, um, air, you don't need bellows. Don't worry about all these dates here. We'll come back to them later. Now, my dissertation showed uh, further work that between the early Iron Age and the later Iron Age from 130 to 1220 AD, there is no evidence of any ironworking, smelting or smithing. Apparently there were important population movements and the metallurgist went elsewhere. Well, we may never know why that's the case, but it is a huge gap. But beginning, excuse me, beginning at about 1220 to 1550, 1600, uh, iron was being produced. Um, and I estimated from converting slag to iron without going into detail here, at up to 20 tons of iron per year. And then beginning in the, in the mid 16th century, we see a rapid increase in growth and we get estimated up to 81 tons of iron four times the amount with long distance trade beginning and increasing in the 19th century to almost 100 tons per year. And that's based on archeological data by what I discovered in the German colonial archives, actually a, a, a totally professor gave it to me, that the Germans weighed iron blooms in the marketplace for seven years and found that they were producing 150 to 200 tons of iron per year. And it was traded throughout most of Togo and um, into a good part of Ghana. And there's some evidence that may have gotten all the way to Asante, the capital of Kumasi, capital of the Asante kingdom, especially in the 17th, 18th, uh, 18th 19th centuries. Now my PhD was focused on finding out what happens when a huge iron working uh, industry arises. What are the effects on the local society? the Basar Society. Um, I found there was a major increase in population, especially after 1600 AD, that villages got bigger from five to seven acres to 17 to 25 acres. Um, and they, they were occupied longer, more stability. Um, and that also by the 17th, 18th century, they, a lot of people moved to live near the major ore deposits um, because it was their lifeblood, iron smelting and smithing for the region. And many villages, that's all they did. And then the long trade, distance trade of iron bloom and tools. But the interesting thing is, despite chiefdoms developing uh, for certain in the eight, eight, uh, eight, late 18th century in Kabu and Basar, 
uh, they never took control of the iron uh, trade. It was family run, lineage run. And they didn't have to pay tribute with iron tools or iron. And the Hausa trading caravans that came from Nigeria through um, the region in the 19th century were not taxed. So it was a, a, not a very powerful chieftain. It was more about protecting the people and solving disputes for many large numbers of people who migrated to the region during those centuries, attracted by the iron production, relatively good farmlands, or they were fleeing uh, civil wars or uh, raids uh, further north. Now, these are drawings of two types of furnaces or two shapes of furnaces, if you will, by Hufeld in 1899. On the left is the furnace typical in the Banjali region. Here are the draft holes that allow the air to come in and then rise out the top. It was about two and a half meters tall, roughly. And uh, it was using very good iron ore. And in the Eastern region, the iron ore, instead of being 70% rich, was 35 to 45% rich in iron with some impurities like phosphorus. And they made much taller furnaces, though you can't see it that well in this diagram, three and a half meters or more in height, very thick walls and so on. And much, um, so west you had the Banjali type furnace on the east, that type of furnace. So now we'll take a look at the Banjali smelting zone. Here is a furnace that was built I believe in the late 60s when I visited with as chairman or treasurer of the History of Geography Teachers Association, we took a trip up there and you can see the draft holes with the triers, they called triers in them where the air comes in and you fill the furnace and light it uh, from, um, from the top. And then this is another example of a later furnace done in the 90s, either 80s or 90s. And this is uh, Monsieur Tigon who is a student of mine at the time uh, and has worked with me several times in the field. He's a professor of history. This is a picture I took in 1981 and these two individuals, especially the one with slightly red, red skin, um, he was a master, uh, if you will, uh, diviner and a healer who also knew how to get the proper roots and other products for medicines that would ensure a successful smelt. Ritual was very important in iron working in Africa and the furnace was considered to be female the smelter, his, her husband, um, and then they gave birth to the iron bloom. So he had all this sexual symbolism, but we might want to say more instead uh, about fertility and procreation associated with taking iron ore and turning it into iron. Here's an example of one of the really large slag mounds that I mentioned earlier with my students sitting up on top. And this is one of the largest furnaces in the Nangbani region, again, back in 81. Uh, and then this is this, um, yeah. I thought I had another photo in there, but it doesn't seem to be there. Oh yeah, here it is. Uh, this is a photo more recent of that same furnace. Um, and it's eroded more. And in fact, here's some other of these large furnaces and the very large draft holes. And I had uh, got money through the US embassy to, to build protective hangars to protect these from wind and rain. Uh, though unfortunately hunters going through lit a fire chasing animals and destroyed the tops of one of the ones in the back. But, but there's an organization now that's doing very well to try to help preserve, preserve this. Togo has given money to do a paved road to the site. It's gonna become a tourist area. And then the blacksmithing techniques. Here's a photo taken by a colleague in 1969 when we visited the Basar region and it's a three-man team that um, normally does the work. And excuse me one second here. It's like there's some changes that I did that are not in this version. I'm not quite sure why that's the case, but we'll get through it. Sorry. Um, apologize there. So you have a three-man team that does smithing. And Nakban, the last living smith, um, was doing the holding the tongs here with a whole blade. And this fellow is the hammer man. We use these big seven to nine kilogram heavy quartzite hammers for rough out work, particularly of whole blades, which start out as a 
a, a thick disc that's an ingot of iron, then it's flattened to become a circular hole blade going in a wooden handle. And then you have the bellows man here in the back. Um, here's an example of a sort of museum type situation in their village with these concertina bellows, which are very powerful. And there's a clay triere that takes it into the smithy. Uh, and then this is one of the embedded ambles I'll talk about later. And here's how the, the air is uh, forced into here, into the smith to do the forging. And here's another fellow from Bicha Bay with the same apparatus without the furnace. Here's a couple of large uh, pounding of shaping hammers. And then this is used for pounding iron bloom into fragments prior to smithing. And then here's a picture of that smithing team at an actual place where a smelter a smith sat. And here's the anvil where they he worked. In fact, it was Chief Jayo. Uh, and that's Chief Jayo right there wielding the hammer, which he was a hammer man as part of a smithing team. And this is the bellows man on the right. And these are some different hammers. You can see some are clearly for flattening out and uh, the size of the hammer. You have others that have, it's hard to see, but little rectangular edges on them that are for some of the finished, semi-finishing hammers. And then um, low carbon steel. And by the way, Africa produced low carbon steel right from the outset of ironworking, going back perhaps to um, 800, 900 BC. Um, and it looks like it was independently developed. There's no evidence that demonstrates it came from elsewhere. Although we, have, we can't prove it yet, but it looks to be an independent industry. And here is a iron ingot flattened out to the wood hole blade that I talked to you about. And uh, these are more uh, blades and uh, ingots. Here's a clay ball that they took iron, which was the iron bloom was crushed into powder to remove excess slag that was still in it. And then this iron powder was put together in a clay ball with roots and, and forged until the iron fused together. And then they eventually broke open the clay ball and finished it to polish into a, or shape it into a circular ingot weighing around 700 to 900 grams. And these are some of the tongs used to hold the tools, particularly the hoe. About 85% of the iron was produced for hoes. I mean, they made axes and other kinds of things, but that was the principal thing. And it was traded in wi wide, widely. Now here is a lucumanjol, which is an iron bloom crushing mortar. And this is one of the big ones at Beach of A proper. And literally all these different size holes were for crushing iron bloom. And the big ones here are up to 40 centimeters deep, slightly bulging at the bottom. They resemble bedrock mortars in the US, but they're, they're different in the shape of the bottom and they're a little deeper. And then you have lots of other smaller ones. And the idea is you take the bloom and the men would break up the bloom, which is about 30 kilograms of iron in a horseshoe shape, break it into a few big pieces. And then the men and also women would crush that taking big uh, quartzite cobbles and throwing them down onto the iron, eventually creating these deep mortars. And here's a close up of some of those deep mortars. And um, then, it was bro broken up into smaller amounts with little hand-sized hammer stones. And you can see much of that work here. And this is where some of the stuff was being converted to power, powder. And this is where it was breaking up some of the larger pieces. And here's the type of, th of quartzite stone, very heavy. You can see the rounded edge that was repeatedly used to end up creating these deep mortars. And here's some of the mortars created by the smaller hammers. This is a photo of the chief, Kofi Seydou, uh, around 1982, after I did uh, ask a lot of questions of the elders here, and we finished up and we drank sorghum beer or millet beer in these calabashes. That's traditional to do that. It's a favorite drink. I remember taking out someone to go in the field and every day, well, we got to buy a couple of calabashes of beer first. Of course, it was always on me, but that's all right. He was working for me. And of course, I was paying him something as well. Uh, it's good stuff. Um, now we'll focus on the early Iron Age, now that we've given some background in my research tactics and um, how traditional smelting and smithing was done in the later Iron Age. Now we're going to the early Iron Age from about 400 BC to 130 AD. This is the site of Dekpasanwar, about 12 kilometers north of Basar, and you can see 
the Sar Mountain, which is quite large, rises 700 um, meters above the uh, plain. And there's a, a dirt road that goes through the site now. When I first worked on it, I just drove down a trail to get to it, but uh, progress took over when I was absent one period. So here we are back to the overall map, and we're going to look at Dekbas and War here. Here's Basar. And then we'll look at the furnace I discovered, remains of an iron smelting furnace here. Uh, this shows the areas that I surveyed. I actually found this site by accident. Actually, my worker Yao Ajankli found it. And um, it's um, here. And then BAS 273 with a furnace is over here. The F here doesn't stand for furnace, it stands for forge, because there's some other pottery scatters of that same time period here. And then here's the Bijalib Iron Mountain or Iron Hill uh, that they used to, at the smelting site of two, uh, BAS 273, BAS standing for Basar. So here's the site of Dekbasanwar. It is 68 acres in size, no small site. And it has six ironworking areas. Um, here's numbers four and five, one and two. This also has a Likumanjo and anvils in it. And then five, three and six um, are somewhat more distant. Uh, and the blue lines indicate the early Iron Age occupation, the green, the later Iron Age, because the site was reoccupied from the late 13th to the early 17th century. And you had traditional natural draft furnaces smelting here and here. Uh, they did not, however, do smithing at this site. And they, whereas smithing was the predominant activity at Dek Basanwar was some iron smelting. I tried very hard to find remains of a furnace here and figured, well, it's seven kilometers away from the ore. My dissertation research suggested they're unlikely to take the ore that far to smelt it. And I turned out to be right. Uh, this here was just a highly concentrated area of later iron uh, uh, occupation. Um, the deposits at this site run about 60 to 100 centimeters in the ironworking zones and about 180 to 220 in the residential zones um, uh, and have a number of burials. We'll be looking at one communal familial burial that I excavated. Here's one of the, when I first got there, one of the tenant croppers, sharecroppers or tenants who were renting the land, Alaji, who's now deceased, brought me this bracelet that he'd found when he was digging earth to build his house behind there. And this is Yao uh, Nakubu, one of my workers for a number of years. Um, so this was the borrow pit where they took the earth to help build the house. And he said, where, I asked him where he found the bracelet. He said, right here. I said, okay. So I put a trench down and at 90 centimeters, I hit another bracelet. <laughs> my pleasant surprise, this is a good start to the season. Um, and then it turned to be a, a, a tomb. And here you can see the top of a big jar I thought was a big bowl, a jar perhaps associated with a burial as well. And here's how it's showing up at 77 centimeters. And the, but we did find remains of a skull inside of it, probably of a child or young person, but not, the rest of the body was down at great, further depth the person may have been in a sitting position, we hypothesize. Uh, and I'm in fact going to try to extract isotopic and protein data as well as DNA from these teeth when I go back to Togo next time. So here's an overview. The bold area was higher up right here and below it is a child's bracelet uh, anklet. And over here are uh, also lower leg bones within a, a, uh, for an adult. Now these are disarticulated. This does not belong to that. Uh, because it was a communal tomb and I've seen this in another part of Togo, they would open the tomb, push bones aside and put new bo bodies in. And so the bones end up being disarticulated and scattered. So it makes a real challenge. Also they're deteriorated after 2,500 years. I had to use toluene to get the bones to stay together in some instances, very difficult excavation. Here's a close up. You can see this is the bracelet that is uh, on the ankle here. Uh, and then that's a close up, which I excavated. And then this is a child's bracelet around part of a, a tibia uh, that was to the right. We also found a skull 
uh, and we said, we'll, we'll excavate that later. But a mouse decided to create a nest there and he created a hole here and then a little trap door at the back did a lot of damage. We didn't know what was happening. This hole is from somebody clubbing the guy in the head that probably killed him. And then this is a iron necklet. So you've got grave goods of iron in this tomb, which is pretty exciting. And that's a close up of that. We also found two major trash dumps doing excavations north, east, and west of the main dirt road. You can see cow mandibles here. There's matates that come up later. Uh, also wattle and daub, burnt wattle and daub, which is taking a pole, pole frame and then putting mud on it. And then it caught fire apparently and, and, and that preserved the daub. Um, now this is a Likumanjol at Dek Basanwar, but 2000 years earlier or 2400 years earlier than the one we saw earlier. When I came, this was all covered with dirt, but I could see some rocks and I asked my people to working for me to clear out the dirt and we found this Likumanjo, otherwise it was invisible. Local farmers didn't even know it was there. In the first season we have uncovered this and then we found two more in the second season. And this is for crushing iron bloom, just like it was done much later. And this is practiced in several parts of Africa, this same process. Here's some close-ups of the mortars. And then there were two anvils about five or 10 meters to the north one right here, one right here using natural rock outcrops. Later they would quarry stone and make the ambles. And you can see the wear that's on here. And now that doesn't prove it's an anvil, but when you forge, there are little tiny traces left behind from the constant hammering, little tiny hammer scales flake off, uh, you know, one or two or three millimeters across, very thin or a little micro spatter, which is liquid slag that squirts out because of the hammering. And this is an example of the micro scatter and hammer scales. And if you find that in the soil, you proved that hot forging took place there. Now here's some bracelets found, some of them given to me by local farmers, including this one that was a pair. And then these are bracelets that were present with the chief in the mid 20th century, but may, may go back several decades. I think they were heirloom items. Here's a quartz vegetable processor, kind of a mini grind, ground stone, about six centimeters long, found in a trash dump. And this is cool. One of the local farmers said he found this in a pottery bowl when he was uh, digging on his land. And it appears to be in a shape of a bird, generalized, abstract. Uh, we have no idea what it means because there's no written records before, pretty much before the 17th century. There was one that after that writing occurs in the 19th century, 1900s. Um, but it's, uh, it's made of pumice, which is also unusual because you'd have to go, go quite a ways to the Northeast to get volcanic material. And this is the bracelet from the familiar lineage tomb that was on the adult, which later was analyzed, I'll show you. Uh, here's one that's heavily corroded that was in un near unit 39 where we found another burial. Here's the child's anklet, not bracelet, uh, that we saw. Uh, and that was also analyzed metallurgically. Here's a finger ring, which is sometimes worn by diviners. I don't know whether it was back then. And it actually found a fragment of a knife blade that still had a lot of iron in it. Um, and um, those are the major finds in terms, the bracelet seemed to last a long time, but we, the knife fragment was a good welcome site. And this part of it was analyzed for a publication this year as well. And we found quartz beads, a couple of rough hewn quartz beads in the tomb, um, iconically drilled. Or, and then this is a labre that would go into the uh, lower lip uh, that women sometimes were, or out of quartz. And this is the dominant ceramics that I labeled bright mica. It's actually full of muscovite. And uh, it's the dominant pottery from just north the, toward the end of the late stone age throughout the entire early iron age. And then it disappears and never comes back. This is an example of a smelting Trier fragment. And it's been completely plugged with slag, clogged with slag, which happens sometimes in during the furnace during smelting. This does not 
occur with smithing tree air fragments. It, sometimes the end melts and you get a little slag around it, but it's rarely plugged with slag because the temperatures aren't as high uh, in the forge as they are in the furnace. And this is the bracelet that was on the adult and burial analyzed by a metallurgist at the University of Arizona, David Killick. And it turned out to be 4% carbon steel. Um, and a little bit of slag still remains though. It didn't quite get all of it out when they forged it. And this is typical of bloomery iron using what we call bloomery furnaces where the iron does not melt like in a modern blast furnace, but it's reduced, the ore is reduced to get rid of the oxygen using carbon monoxide from the wood fuel. And um, um, the, um, the bloom always has some slag mixed in it when it's produced. And it, you don't, and it's typical of blooms to be have some slag left in them. This is one of the trash dumps in 2008 we excavated, because expanding the one before, we found a lot of good stuff here. And in both years, we found definite evidence of, of uh, millet, uh, pearl millet, and uh, black eyed peas or cow peas, as they're called elsewhere, as well as. Uh, uh, and we'll get, come back to what plant foods were found later. Here's some of the types of bees we found out of shell, chert, rose quartz, and chalcedony. And there are more than these few shown here, uh, but they were not real numerous, but they are definitely there. And they're also at the smelting site that I'll be talking about later. Here is a magnificent polishing stone, perhaps for house walls, but it's also polished on the edges. So it may have been ceremonial as well. It's about five centimeters in diameter two centimeters thick. I mean, I'm not sure what stone it's made of. Okay, in terms of diet from the early Iron Age, definitely Pearl Minute, which actually goes back to 4,000 years ago in the Sahel in West Africa, uh, and it was also at this site. And then cow pea, yams, almost certainly, but we couldn't find sorghum because this site was abandoned in 130 AD and sorghum doesn't appear in West Africa at that latitude to about 500 AD maybe a little younger. And Fonio, a small, very tiny grain grown from central Nigeria to central Togo, uh, and it grows wild. We could not find that either. The charcoals, however, suggested that you already had a situation where the fields were there and only certain trees were preserved, primarily um, the nere, karate, or shear butter, shear butter, and the baobab. So you had well-cultivated land uh, in a park situation back at 2,400 years before. The domesticated foods were almost entirely, they dominated the assemblage, quite shocking, because in Ghana, most of the sites, they found an important wild animal component. But here it was almost entirely West African short horn cattle, a goat, sheep, and perhaps some guinea fowl. Um, and then uh, I had another final analyst who could had good comparative collections and found small amounts of hare and antelope and a rodent, but it was a very small percentage, uh, five or ten percent of the assemblage. Um, in the later Iron Age, sorghum is added to the diet along with groundnuts, sesame seeds, taro root, and tobacco, okra, and peppers, likely. And here again, these are the major, these are key economic foods. Sure, but sure, butter you probably heard of used in cosmetics and uh, skin lotions. And then of course, palm nuts from the palm nut trees, as well as yams. And longhorn cattle were added to the mix, as well as the chicken, which came from West Africa around, uh, from uh, Asia and got to West Africa by about 500 AD. And then leopards and monkeys and occasionally hippos were consumed, according to Frobenius who visited in 13. We didn't find any of that, however. Now we go on to the 2000, 13 field season. Uh, and one of the goals was to get charcoal from a lot of slag mounds in the Bicha Bay smithing region to see when smelting took place there because the people say they found those when they arrived, they don't know who smelted there. And here we're excavating the charcoal and the three um, uh, non-Togolese are my American students. I always have students come with me if they can pay airfare, I pay their room and board and internal travel and they're, they're my archeology span students in the program at Palomar as well. And we found lots of charcoal here. And all of these sites in five different villages in the beach of Iresen, they all dated between 1380, 1280 and 1420, as I said earlier. So they apparently 
stop smelting whoever's smelting there by the early 15th century. And then here is the Lucumanjo we saw earlier, broader view at Bicha Bay. And then this is an example of a small Lucumanjo that was, this would have been used primarily for creating the iron powder. It may also have been used to grind up slag that was um, pout, uh, slag into powder that was mixed with earth that was made for the wa for walls of houses and for courtyards to harden them. Um, and this is having millet beer in front of Chief Jayo's house. And Yao is a jonkly on the right. As I say, he was still working for me. I was there in the field in February this year, just before the virus hit, um, and doing some GPS mapping. Um, here's a zone of where they were manufacturing anvils. As I said, they quarry the uh, ambles and drag them on a wooden sled two or three kilometers away, probably beginning in the 17th century because of the high output, they decided to make their own ambles. This is a high quality quartzite. And uh, this is at the site of Upper Bijomambi we'll be talking about later. And here's at Upper Bijomambi. And this was a collection of various hammers near uh, an anvil and a house where it, was, it still had walls to it, where people lived until about 1980. We'll come back to Bijomambe and the other smithing sites, but now we're gonna look at the um, smelting site, which is here. This is Bijalib, about 1100 meters to the south. These are the remains of, of furrows left for growing sorghum, and then there's some excavation units. The site's about uh, one uh, about 1.1 acres, pardon me, uh, 2.7 acres, I believe, 2.5 acres. And this is a map of the site based on our excavations. I had found this site in 1982 and relocated it and thought maybe we can find a furnace here because it's close to the uh, ore sources. So this was a residential district based on my excavations. Here we found a meter thick of triers, which are the vehicles for putting air from bellows into a furnace or in natural draft furnaces, furnace fragments and lots of slag. So this was a dump. And then I thought, well, to the south would be a good place for them to put the furnaces. And I was gonna put down unit 11 and I saw thousands of ants going across the site with about six inch wide band of nothing but ants. I said, I don't think people wanna excavate in the middle of that. So I moved the unit over a meter and that's how I found the furnace because there was no indication on the surface. I just got lucky. I was looking in the general right place, but we could, we tried to find more afterwards and didn't find them. Here is a, uh, a long smelting tree air at uh, BAS 273, still in situ. And here's some that have been excavated. Uh, they get up to 20 centimeters long. The other part that didn't get fired because it was outside the furnace uh, doesn't, doesn't preserve. And a few of them had these banded patterns on, which we don't know if it was stylistic or functional, uh, but this is an example. Here's the end of the tree that was partly melted from being in the furnace. And then this is the other end where it's broken off because it wasn't fired the rest of it. So it's not like pottery and doesn't preserve. Here's another one of the banded triers and the part broken off the melted end. And it's often glazed. You can see the glazed area here indicating that a good part of the furnace triere was in the furnace and that these are definitely smelting triers and not smithing triers. In fact, we could find no evidence whatsoever of smithing not even microspower, hammer scales, nothing uh, at that site. It was just a smelting site. Now this is unit 11 and a student was excavating it. And I had already seen something that looked suspicious. We brought it out and turned out to be a big piece of what I thought was the furnace wall, maybe, but it seemed pretty thin. Um, turned out it was the side of a slag pit that was underneath the furnace, which we didn't know was there yet. And then as we finished the unit, we found this in the profile. So that piece you were looking at on actually fit on to where it's broken off here. And this is a pit where the liquid slag drains away from the iron that's forming in a solid state in the furnace. And here's a piece of slag here. And then it, they didn't build this, they simply dug a hole and the liquid slag coming down in here 
uh, oxidize the surrounding soil to varying colors. In fact, it's not even oxidized here, but you can see it's well oxidized there. So um, that was the furnace. And I have to say, it was my Indiana Jones moment. I was running around the site screaming and singing and yahoo, yahoo. I <laughs> looked like an idiot. And then we dug about 20 centimeters away from the wall and went down. And by God, we found remains of the base of the furnace. So here I've dug into the furnace uh, pit to get slag for analysis, which was published this, this, this past year. And here is a piece of the furnace base that was fired really, really hard. It was very difficult to cut it in half um, and for TL dating. And I finally got a date later of 200 BC plus or minus 120 or from 320 to 80 BC, which fits perfectly into the dates based on charcoal and the ceramics that are at the site. You couldn't ask for a better correspondence with thermal luminescence dating, which can date fired clayed, ob clayed objects. And then this is um, the piece of uh, um, slag I took from the furnace in order to um, analyze it. Here I am with a small um, stone trying to chip off a piece uh, with a nail splitting it because it's pretty lightweight. It has a lot of hollow areas in it as slag can in some cases. And then this is the end of the excavations. This is one of the uh, Togolese, pardon me, Palomar students uh, and Tia. And then this is Yao Ajankli. And these are uh, Togolese uh, graduate students in archeology. span And then these are crew from these two people and these two from the local area helping us excavate. It, by the way, it rained two minutes after this photo was taken, really hard. And then before I left that year, I backfilled the furnace with river sand that looked very different from the local soil to so be easy to find it again. And then put 40 pound cement uh, blocks around it. And then in areas in the middle, not in places that would damage anything on side. And went to the owner in a village near Kabu and explained and showed him on site to protect it. It turned out though that this year, I, or 19, 2019, I had to come and have this redone because some of the bricks have been taken. And I went around and we got a large crowd to sort of tell them about what this is and how old it is. And we redid it and we cemented the blocks together so they won't get uh, taken to hold on roofs in storms because that's why the people take them because they're very heavy. They hold on the roof so it doesn't blow off in a cyclone. So now we go to the more recent years from 2015 to 20. And I excavated the largest smelting site with the adjacent to about 500 meters from Chogma One, the big slag mound site I talked to you about. It's about 10.3 acres in size. And here is where Tatur is located. And here is Chogma One. This is the Banjali area. And smelting was done in this area and smithing all in, in, in this area. Smelting and smithing took place here as well, associated with the chiefdoms at Sara near Kabu, and then in, in Bina Parba, smithing and smelting in Nangbani and Byakpabe. Um, and here's a couple of big sites with huge amounts of slag and furnaces. 70, there were 71 standing furnaces in various degrees of shape because of thick walls when I was there in the 80s, and most of them are still there. Here's a map. This is north from right to left. Here is uh, Tatur. These are smaller slag mounds around it. And then this is Chogma. And um, um, there are market sites, there were here and here for, for selling bloom. And, um, uh, and then uh, these are other slag sites here and here. It was a very high productive area. They fled this area about the late 18th century because of attacks by the Chukosi from the north and the Dagomba from the northwest and moved to different areas, but they continued in South Banjali. So here's a shot, shot of Tatur in 1981. Um, and you can see a lot of trees and, and then baobab trees that were there. But since then it's been cleared for farming uh, more recently. And uh, here's some of the baobab trees that remain. There are seven others that had fallen. People showed me where they were and I mapped it. This one was full of bees, by the way, so we had to be careful when we worked around there because uh, they'll attack you a hundred strong and 
and kill you. A Peace Corps volunteer was killed in 1886 from being stung a hundred times, climbing the tree, not too bright a move. Um, here is a slag mound uh, with children using skins to slide down it uh, when I visited in 81. Here's Chogma, the actual smelting site. These are surface collection areas and then excavation units. Uh, and then these are baobabs here at stand today. And we had a ceremony with the local uh, uh, diviner and the chief and some of the students here from Palomar on Andre and, and uh, Jacob um, and Yao is here. And this is a sacred forest for their prime um, uh, spirit, if you will. And they sacrificed the goat and the chicken and before to ask the ancestors permission to dig in the ground and wish us success. That's pretty much standard procedure to do that. Now briefly, um, my main point here in the pottery, most of it was Konkomba pottery, which is in Western areas, not found in Eastern Bazaar. Uh, and the trade wares here listed, fine mica and um, brownware, um, help identify and help date the site. And, I, and then this is some of the, the faunal remains, mostly domestic goat, sheep, probably some antelope, cattle, some birds, tortoises, rats, uh, a few dog bones. The concomba uh, uh, sometimes eat dogs and use the, the teeth for decorative ornaments. And I'll show you that later. And uh, a few pig bones, some fish from the OT River probably, which is about 35 kilometers away uh, and cat and unidentified. And then also some shellfish, a mussel, and uh, mostly freshwater, one terrestrial land snail, and then a few cowrie shells used for money. And we found two spindle whorls used in spinning cotton. Um, I don't know when they date during the occupation of the site, but they're, uh, we'll talk about the, the site itself dates from the early 14th to the early 19th century. And then here three glass beads were found. These are Venetian or Bohemian beads from Europe and they date from the 17th to the 19th century. Um, and then for dating to tour, as I said, the dates were early 14th and 19th, and we dug pits that found remains of smelting toward the bottom with furnace remains, suggesting they were smelting at the site first, and later it de developed into a smelting village, maybe by the 15th or 16th century. And so you've got dating from uh, two radiocarbon dates from 1980s at Chogma, where they smelted, and 17 radiocarbon dates in 1617, um, and we dated it with trade wear sherds and their attributes, ceramic tobacco pipes, which are uh, developed in the late 1500s, imitating American tobacco pipes when tobacco was brought over by the Portuguese to West Africa. And they became very common in the 17th and 18th century in West Africa, the beads, similar period. And then oral traditions helped me determine the site along with pottery was abandoned about 1800, 1825. But there was a reoccupation, as I said, by, I, excuse me, because um, in one unit we found three perforated dog canines and punched cowrie shells. Uh, those are concomba, they wouldn't be basar, plus some metal, metal alloy fragments and a screw bolt. So clearly somebody else was living there, maybe in the late 19th, 30th, 20th century, but the local concomba didn't know anything about it, which was very puzzling. Now the art, art, iron artifacts included nails, hoe fragments, iron bar, rods or bars, arrow points, arrow shafts, knife fragments, chain link, some for musical instruments they use for the fire dance, um, sheet metal, uh, wire, and then some wire, twisted wire fragments that may have been for sacred pendants, two triggers for animal traps and an adze blade in metal. Some Stone Age stuff, a few flakes, but there's no evidence of any late Stone Age occupation at the site. What was puzzling was there were almost no grinding tools, monos or matatis. We found a single mono in 24 units of excavation going down to often do um, 100 to 140 centimeters in depth. And we think it's because when they moved, they only moved a kilometer away to the south and they took all their grinding tools with them, along with most of their 
mortars for grinding sorghum, which we didn't find either. So that's the likely explanation of that, because I doubt they imported all their food, all they could have selling iron bloom. They still would have ground the sorghum themselves. Um, tobacco pipes, I'm not gonna go through all this different, but they did have sometimes a self slip, which is a thin coat of the clay made to make the pipes. And sometimes they were red slipped or painted with hematite paint from grinding up hematite ore. And some of them were smudged uh, with all sorts of different gray decorations. But I'll get to that in a minute right now, <laughs> exactly. These are some pipes from there. Now, these are only about five centimeters to six centimeters in length. And usually they're fragmentary because they're fired clay. This has the trier where you put a reed in to smoke from and then the bowl would be here and then the base down there. Here's one with four lobes on it, another style that first shows up in Ghana um, and part of the, a lot of the bowl. And then here's a couple of other interesting ones um, where the base flows right up into the trier. And here you have a distinct base, but then flows upward into the trier, the trier being the smoking pipe, uh, not the bowl, the pipe uh, stem. And these were smoked by, they could be smoked by a reed coming out of the mouth down into the pipe. You'd actually sit it on the floor and there's a lot of abrasion on the bottom of these suggesting that's exactly how it was used. Um, and here's a couple of others. There's the base, there's the trier and the lip. Here's another with part of the bowl and a nice round base, typically 17th, 18th century. We also found potsherd pavements like this, they were probably in a courtyard because that's a tradition we find around West Africa. Um, and um, these are take, made of taking bottoms of, of jars and bowls and just crushing them in place, placing others by hand perhaps, but it's almost all undecorated pottery. This is a two by uh, two meter unit. And here's a close up, or actually it's two by three meters. And this is at 18 to 32 centimeters in depth. But then we found another level at 58 to 62 centimeters. And this one has slag in it and it has uh, some flakes. Uh, and it was a lot of decorated shirts. So it was here's some of the slag right in here. Um, and it was used to harden the surface of courtyards so it wouldn't get muddy. And they glue these in with a mixture of neri juice and charcoal at the bottom so they wouldn't come up easily. And that's another view of that same one. And the lowest one at about 90 centimeters is right there. This gives a better idea of the color of this where they use colorful shirts rather than dull shirts. Here's a map showing, here's the original area that was at 18 to 32 centimeters. Here's where the 58 to 62 and there the 90. So you had three layers of shirt pavements indicating rebuilding of houses and courtyards on top of the foundations of old houses that had collapsed. And we found a second set of those here uh, with a level at 19 to 20. 70 to 88, although this was actually a, a bowl basin, maybe for washing babies. Um, uh, and the shirts were held in place again with the glue of the charcoal and the neri juice. And then a third at 100 centimeters. Uh, and we have dates down to the 14th or 15th century at the bottom here. And evidence of smelting in this unit as well, one of the two cases. And here is an example show of what was going on in the drawing. Here's the upper level. Here's the basin, which I'll show in more fully excavated form when I excavate that, and then the lower one. And here's the basin and a piece of chart. Uh, oops, there's the, the lower one close up. And then this is a shirt removed from there and you can see the charcoal uh, nary mix that had glued it in place. And this is the final uh, slide showing um, uh, various kinds of vegetations, I won't get into it here, the three baobabs and these little green dots indicate where former baobabs were. But I see we're getting a bit short on time. So I'm gonna to have to move more quickly here. Um, this is the Bichabai region. And this is a map, Bichabai region. And this is a map based on archeology span I've done. Here's the village of Bichobebe. Here's the village of Bijomambe and here a modern day Bichabe. And these are archeological sites, Old Bicha Bay and Pachanli. These people later moved here. And then Upper Bijomambe was possibly a refuge site, but is also uh, has a sacred forest where they say God created the people of Bijomambe who, who claimed to be indigenous. And then um, Bichobebe, 
uh, site. Now, it apparently is 625, so I'm going to have to skip some things here. What I was going to show you is um, comparing three sites to see how their site was organized. In Bicha Bay, you find each, each individual community or quartier in Bicha Bay um, has their own housing zone and people had their ambles near their houses. But they also had at least one area, maybe two, where they smelted uh, together as a group. So they did both. Um, and um, uh, so I sought to see what the archeological situation was. And there was two models I considered, and I'm gonna skip over some of this because there's not time. One model is like the early Iron Age example of Decpas and War, everybody lives in a residential area, but does all their ironworking outside because we found little or no evidence of smithing debris or any furnace uh, forges or anything in the residential area. And then the other model is one in which you would have each major house complex would have an anvil and it's working for smithing not too far from it with some maybe common middens outside that would have other debris thrown there as well as slag, but they didn't smith there. Now, Epirabidjomambe is 35.8 acres, and here it is mapped, the GPS. Here is a satellite view of it. The sacred forest is right there. You can see the difference by the vegetation. The rest of this is imported teak trees, which are taken over the site. Here's an old cotton field. These are Likomanjo, especially these three here for processing the bloom. Um, and here is a site based on all the data I collected of houses where they were, slag mounds, little tiny slag mines by the houses. And you notice here in the south, this area was abandoned earlier than this area, which in the south, which was abandoned in the 70s, early 80s. You see the red anvils, and they're paired with the little Likomanjols for making iron powder by the men. And it's a standard pattern you see all around the site. And there are some three slag mounds here, somewhat larger, probably used by these three houses here. Um, and up here, you sometimes see slag mounds toward the exterior of the zone, but it's essentially the pattern of individual houses with smithing. And I have a new map coming out with ads up to 20, up from 20 to 27 houses working with elders and tracking the generations that lived here that I haven't uh, completed yet. Uh, so it did tended to fit the model. And this site dated probably from the late, later 18th to the mid 20th century, but Bijumambi itself was occupied as early as the 14th or 15th century. I have data from that elsewhere. Here's Chief Jayo. Here's um, collecting information on traditions in Bijomambe, not in, down below where most people live. Here's a fetish or, uh, area to his grandfather. Uh, these are little small ironworking hammer stones. And he is said to have disappeared in the ground without dying. Some important men uh, la later become kind of semi-deities in their, in their mind. Um, and this was one of them, it's Jayo's grandfather. And this is a rainmaking shrine and uh, uh, that was rebuilt a few years ago. You can see the money that's offering in it. And I don't know if this is supposed to resemble Nampajalpu, but there was a woman who was associated with activating that and who lived up there as well. And here's a close up of this, uh, a better picture showing the sacred forest with the furnaces and Lukumanjols around it. And um, I won't go into the detail, but it perfectly fit the, the um, pattern here. Uh, everything was fulfilled that would match the pattern was there. And upper, and here we go, all the check mark means yeah, everything fit. Now, old Bichabe, um, Bichobebe was, I'm gonna spend briefly, this is an aerial photo of it. It's just right down below upper Bichomambe, which is over here. And um, here's a um, area of shrines in that site. And this is the complete map showing slag mounds, anvils, anvil fragments, um, smaller, whatever, but it tends to fit the same pattern, except over here, there may have been an area where they smelted without houses. A uh, housing indication would come from the um, small de slag deposits, the, the granary mortars that are in blue here. And uh, the Likomanjols, many of them were over here in natural rock outcrops at the head of a big hill, a terrace where 
upper Bijomambe is, so you don't always get the pairing. Plus the village of today is only 400 meters to the north and they probably recycled a lot of mortars and anvils even uh, <clears throat> as they continued. But I will not go through all of this because we don't have time. It is already 6.30 and uh, I wanna quickly um, look at old Bicha Bay which you can see has lots of school buildings on it and more buildings were built here. I was gonna study this area and I came back and they built a nursery school there. Here's some very large Likamanjols there. And you saw this one in photos and these are all teak tree forests mostly. And um, so a lot of damage has been done here. Plus Bichabe is right here where they moved at the late 19th century. And so a lot of things are missing. So here's a, a complete map of it and it, has lots of Likomanjol, little ones for doing the iron powder, but a lot of the anvils are gone. They've been removed. Um, and you do see evidence for people working in groups. And here is, uh, let me go a little further down here. This is what I think were different communities and where they work. The Papa Joel community worked here, Nataku here, Bitabitapu here. And this was a joint area here, but there's evidence here of where people, multiple people had anvils and lots of slag and also here suggesting work groups with a number of families not directly associated with houses. And that would fit the, what the present day Bichabe pattern. And this was where they were before they moved there. So that makes a lot of sense. And then I wanted to show you a few more triers from Pachanli site, which we haven't really discussed much, but it dated. What was cool about this site is I found evidence for smithing in the 14th century when they were smelting. And uh, under, on top of it, was the later period when people migrating from Ghana, Yendi came and brought smithing with them. So I found it stratified in place with dating. So that was really cool. And um, we have 13 radiocarbon dates from this pretty large site, which is um, shown right here. Um, and this is a, a sacred area. And this is a ceremony that took place there before sacrificing a chicken before we were allowed to excavate that we got to eat the chicken. Uh, this is another shrine by one of the Baobabs. This is a, a, a pretty substantial Lukumanjo associated with the site that Yao and I are mapping. And here's Yao hang, hamming it up next to one of the big Lukumanjo motors uh, and some others up on top. This is traditional house decoration um, and traditional housing. This is at the chief's house in Bijomambe. And then I, we did find a burial date, um, dating to uh, 18th century, 17th or 18th century at 150 centimeters down. We didn't excavate it, but I took a little of the bone, got a radiocarbon date from it. And then uh, what I have left is 630. Um, I'll go for a couple of minutes and show you some more furnaces and that'll leave time for talk questions. So I'm gonna go quickly, but these are furnaces from a couple of the sites in Bichabe and they're often penis shaped when, in some bases with the shape of the base, not always. Here's a cool one, the way it's decorated, really nice, different from a tattoo. And these are all about five to six centimeters. These are bowl fragments. Here's one of the triers. Um, that was, and then he, here's um, Likumanjol. This is the owner of the property at Abidjan, um, this big smithing village down Bijomambe, the lower Cartier. And then this is the borrow pit where I found exposed pottery pavement. We excavated the site. And these are graduate students, Paku, um, Severin, and Pidenue. These two are about to have their PhDs awarded. He's working on it. There's another one not present. This is where units one and two were excavating. And then here's a only fire clay bead we found that's decorated. Um, and then here's some other ceramic tobacco pipes, sometimes with red slips on them that wash off if you're not careful. Here's some bowl fragments well decorated. And there's the square base on that one. That was pretty cool. Almost complete, gives you an idea about what they look like. The bowl's missing though. There's the bottom side, upside down, you name it, lip painted with hematite. Some others, a lot of red hot. This one's got a four lobe base and some parts of the lobes are there with, that are decorated. And then here's another few others. This one we found at um, 90 to 200 in a unit that went down 240 centimeters, found pipes at 90 to 120. Um, and I'm waiting for a TL date at 220 centimeters to see if I've got early deposits down that low. And 
That's it. Sorry, I went over a bit, about five minutes. Thank you so much, Dr. DeBarros. My name is Dante Ferenga, and I'm the Development and Marketing Director at the San Diego Archaeological Center. I will be facilitating the Q&A portion of tonight's lecture. Thank Just you. as a reminder, <laughs> thank you. As a reminder, you can submit your questions using the Q&A feature on your Zoom menu. And I think we have a few questions already. Well, should I go ahead and uh, unshare? Um, up to you. <laughs> yeah, I think I will. Just, um, whoops. Okay. All right. All right. One of our questions is, what are the furnaces made of? It looks like soil. It is a, a, a clay, a re highly refractory clay. So it withstands the temperature of the furnace, which can get up to 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, or centigrade, excuse me, centigrade. Um, and the tree airs, they guide the air from the bellows is also made of a similar material. Sometimes they add some temper to it. Some places in Africa have added slag or other things to it as well. Uh, sometimes quart is, quartz is added um, to the tree airs uh, which, uh, and the furnace. Uh, and that sometimes serves as a flux to lower the temperature for smelting. Right. Someone said it was strange that the elites did not control a big valuable resource. Could you explain? I didn't quite hear that. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Someone said that the elites, they thought it was strange that the elites didn't control the big, uh, such a big valuable resource. Could you explain? Well, you know, what we're finding out, and I've published on this, the kind of models we use for economic growth and development and association don't, are not the same in, in West Africa. Sometimes they are, but often they aren't. Uh, in Africa, you see an emphasis on wealth in people rather than wealth in land or other source. And um, there was the, the clans in Basar in particular, they assimilated on a regular basis migrants who would come there. If they've been the second generation, just like in the United States, a second or third generation, they become Basar. Like my friend Yao Lamba speaks fluent Basar. Um, and so um, they're very, they were the ones who had been smelting for centuries. And when the chiefdom developed, they were very, very resistant to the chiefdom extending any power. Now, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And you have kingdoms and empires and chiefdoms in West and East Africa. But in these, a lot of iron smelting societies didn't necessarily, some of them did not develop such type chiefdoms. And uh, I initially thought a Western model would work. But as I've worked and done research, there's just no evidence that this was the case, even though the chieftain had been around a couple of centuries. All right. Um, the next question is, what were the defining characteristics of the market sites? It would just be an open air site, the thing you would have, you would have stones as seats that the market women would sit on and um, uh, people would bring their wares. There probably were things made of wood with thatch that would keep people out of the sun for when they would actually sell their, their wares. Uh, but those of course have disappeared. So when you find a market site, you might find some pottery. I suppose if you excavated, you might find some interesting artifacts now and then if they preserved. I did find a smoking pipe in, in, in one of the markets north of Tatur, but um, that's pretty much it. And in modern day markets, they built big multi-story buildings with stalls for people. But also a lot of trade happened like for the sale of the iron bloom, the cabier from the east would come directly to markets or sometimes to, uh, yeah, to markets, but the smiths to the south would get the bloom from the producer at his house. And it was only about you know, 12 kilometers away. And um, the wife would get the parts that were uh, particularly slag for using to harden floors and whatever, as well as uh, some other purposes. Uh, but the bloom was then, as I've said, broken up by the men. But the women did most of the, of the, the larger breakup and they did powdering as did the men. So um, I'm not sure if I fully answered the question. <laughs> All right. 
Someone said you pointed out several of your local students were working on their PhDs. Was that in the US or in Togo? No, they're working at the University of Lome and they have a French woman uh, and uh, another doctoral uh, a person with a doctorate uh, is Togolese on their committee, plus someone from Benin who has his PhD as an archeologist. And I advise the students, but I'm not on the committee. Um, and they have essentially submitted their dissertations and they're revising them. And uh, they're all, they're three Togolese students that should have PhDs by later this year. And they've done, they've worked on many of my sites since 2013 as students when they were, you know, master level students. And then we have a question from Betsy Payne from Palomar. She asks, what is the future for your research? Will you be going back to the field? The virus willing, <laughs> I, I, I may, may go back, uh, but um, I've got a lot of, it's, I spent a lot of time writing these books. I haven't even begun the second one. I'm still doing up the research and other things. So I don't know if I'll go again or not. Uh, I need to be sure I publish what I've done rather than <laughs> disappearing without having done that. So uh, I might go back, but it wouldn't be before 22 or 23. And I have been taking students from Palomar since 89, or actually Orange Coast College in the 2000s. And so, um, and I always try to do that if they're available as we did this year in January, February. Right. Any environmental pollution from the slag heaps or effects on the people living in the area? Well, they haven't really smelted since in big time since the 1920s or 19, early 1900s. They were still smelting till the 50s. Then it was um, forbidden by the French saying you're burning up too many trees. And there was a big deal about did the smelting cause deforestation? And there's been a lot of research on since initial ideas in the 80s that one of my colleague graduate students, Candy Goucher wrote about, but it's finding, looking more and more like these forests could regenerate themselves pretty well, but there might've been localized areas where they're denuded, but they, the Bassar was importing from Dumeri, 20, 10, 15 kilometers to the South. They were importing it from near Cabu, 20 kilometers to the East and from the Concomba from the Northwest. So it didn't stop them from smelting. Um, you know, if it continued at large kale in pot, there may have been a problem like that, but it's controversial to say whether it really did cause it as extensively as it would later in Europe um, in the 18th, 19th century. Can the iron produced in this region be traced using trace elements? If so, how far was it traded? Well, my uh, colleague, uh, Caroline Rubian Brunner, who's from Toulouse in France and who's an archeologist working as a government researcher, She's done just that in a project from 15, 16, 17, where she uh, found different furnace technologies by the slag signatures, along with uh, her colleague, uh, uh, Marie-Pierre Couture, uh, and they're gonna publish a book on this. And they also identified things that would you'd be able to look at an iron tool and find out if it was made in Basar. And she got another grant for Ghana, Benin, and Togo to do that in Ghana and in Basar region of Togo and into Benin. Um, it's been held up by the virus though. They did collect samples of iron, uh, slag and iron, but I don't know if they had done any analysis yet because that's archeo, what we call archeometallurgy has become a big field in the last 10 years where people get degrees in archeometallurgy, how to analyze slag with you know, expensive instruments like ion probes and, and that kind of thing to, to try to follow that up with time. But I didn't have that at my uh, disposal and didn't really know a lot about that when I did my work. I've learned a lot recently though. All right, I think we have time for a few more questions. So once again, just a reminder, if anybody has any questions, please drop them in the Q&A. We've had a few very nice comments saying that they very, they enjoyed today's talk and enjoyed Thanks. looking into a new place and culture that they haven't seen. And I think we have one more question. Were, the shells, were any of the shells used for jewelry? Well, bracelets, anklets, necklets, um, finger rings, um, they didn't embroider them with gold or diamonds. There's no gold in that area. It is in Ghana, though. Uh, so we've never found gold there. Um, 
there may have been some simpler type things, but especially for the early Iron Age, a lot of the iron is gone. Um, later Iron Age, I haven't really seen, let me think, there are, there are, when they had the fire dance, which is a major event to get rid of evil spirits and things that seem to be threatening the community, really interesting dance. It's on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Um, they did have these leggings that they were musical instruments because they had these bangles hanging from it that when they did their dance and jumped up and down, jumped over the fire, they would make a, a sound. But as far as um, what you might call a brooch or a necklace, they probably had those in cowrie shells, uh, but they, they survive as individual cowrie shells. They may have had those, although I'm not sure that the Basar did in particular. Um, and then they had the imported shell beads from that were strung uh, during, uh, so that's, they did do that. They had the imported beads from Europe that they strung up as well as sometimes cowrie shells. Um, so, but in iron, no, not that I'm aware of, you know, in terms of a necklace or whatever, a brooch or something like that. All right, well, it's, uh, both Betsy Payne from Paramore College and Dr. Timothy Gross both say thank you. They very much enjoyed this. I know, yes. Hi, you. Tim. Hi, Betsy. Um, <laughs> I, I, one last moment, I would, one of the things I do when I'm there is I visit with local Peace Corps volunteers in Basar. And I was a volunteer for six years and I was a teacher of history and geography, but there are all sorts of other kinds of jobs because that was kind of rare. I was asked specially to do that when I got there. And anybody considering the Peace Corps, if you have a BA, you can get in. The competition is tough, but it's an experience that's worth a lifetime. I guarantee it. So I hope I strongly suggest you try it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. DeBarros. <laughs> and thank you all for attending. So just as a reminder, thank you for everyone for attending tonight's living room lecture. And our lecture series continues in February with Ancient Maya Cave Rituals with Dr. John Spinard. For more info on this and other upcoming events, please visit our website, sandiegoarchaeology.org. Thank you and have a good night.